So the oneness I feel is that we're all sentient beings. So I'm connected to my donkey on that level. And I'm connected to all of us also as human primate animals. And we have that in common. Basically, our brains are similar. They have different capacities and different programming, but they're, they work basically the same. We have the same kinds of desires, the same need for nutrition and safety and all the rest of it. And that's the level on which I would say we're all one, not on some magical thinking vibrations and all that. That's a nice idea, but I see no evidence. I, don't, I see not much evidence for it. So um, I think Joan had a question. Could we pass the microphone? Oh, you have a question there? Ward. Ward? Yes. I, I was with some friends recently, and I uh, noticed a book in his living room. And it's a book you probably all know much better than I. It's called I Am That. <laughs> that. And, it, and the phrase that I read, and I'd like your thoughts on it, um, is um, understand the root cause of your fears, estrangement from yourself. Yes. And that struck me as something I had to read a lot in the moment. And so comment on estrangement, estrangement from, from oneself. Okay. Um, I, before I get to that, Nisargadatta is a major figure for many of us and has influenced a lot of the teachers who are spiritual teachers. A lot of them like to trace a lineage where Nisargadatta is the big man in the sky there and they're all descending from him and have the authority of that lineage. So to people like that who might be watching the movie or whatever, I'd like to point out that a man named David Godman interviewed Nisargadatta. This is available on video. And he asked Nisargadatta if his followers understood what he was saying. And he said, no, only one of them ever did. Maurice Fridman understood me and the others didn't. So the teachers now are the ones who didn't understand him and are now explaining what he really meant. This is exactly what I've been speaking about, estrangement from oneself. If you take someone else's ideas on how to live properly, you are instantly estranged from yourself. You must be a light unto yourself. Otherwise, if you give your authority to someone else, you don't know what they'll do with it. And you don't know really on what basis to assign that authority to someone else. And after all, suppose you find someone and you find that person compelling and you say that person is wise, that person is a sage, and therefore I will listen to whatever they say and take it to heart. On what basis have you made the judgment that that person is a sage? Well, on your own judgment, obviously. How could it couldn't come from somewhere else? And so since you're going to use your judgment to project that authority outwardly, you may as well just use the judgment and forget about the projection because it's always going to boil down to either being a light unto yourself or projecting the power to be a light onto someone else. The light of another person can't be your light. They have a whole different set of needs. Nisargadatta wasn't Robert Saltzman. I can't take his word for anything. But I like a lot of what Nisargadatta had to say. One of the best things he said is, you are not in God. God is in you. Now, that means that God is a creation of the human mind. That's what he was saying. But his followers don't like that. And so that's the part that gets misunderstood, as he told David Godman. And instead, you get a bunch of preacher types. See, Nisargadatta was not a preacher. Nisargadatta was, was a um, philosopher and a really powerful one. And he was a tough motherfucker. He really was. He threw people out. He told people to shut up and don't come back. 
He was not one of these beautiful people who just have their bookshop out there. And they're not like that. It's not like that. He doesn't have a bunch of flowers and all this and stagecraft, John Troy calls this stagecraft. So um, b I guess before we get to Joan's question, I'd like to ask John to comment on the stagecraft end of it and any other related matters. Are you willing to do that? Yeah, there's a name I'd like to mention. Oh. And, and it's in that same in that same area, Ramana Maharshi. There's so many who go back to that as a touchstone in this whole non-duality phenomenon that we see taking root and manifesting in all these different ways. Whether it's Muktananda, the Nityananda, Yogananda, uh, Papaji, Gangaji, I mean, pretty much the whole crowd kind of goes back to uh, things that emerged after Ramana Maharshi. I happened to become best friends with. Ramana Maharshi's nephew, Ganeshan. And we were, about the, we were about the same age, and we were really pals. That relationship was built on a mutual understanding that uncle was an ordinary human being and brought up repeatedly from the beginning to the very end of our relationship, and it did end over that. There were many stories that were shared with me about the museum, the meal ticket, the organ, the, the family cleaning the archives out to take away anything that would detract from him being seen as the Messiah. Many stories, many stories about things that would make the news as this is horrible behavior from Ramana Maharshi, uncle. This washed away, it's hidden, buried. When the quote came out, and it was specifically that, Tripp was heard it, was there and heard it. The witnesses, other people. Uncle was an ordinary human being, not a messiah. Ramana Maharshi was an ordinary human being, just like Robert. A century ago, about this many people were sitting in a little room on the other side of the world having the same conversation. Before the, 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 this many people came, it was just he and his mom and his brother living in a cave up on the mountain. And some yogi came along called Kavya Kantha, who was a well-known yogi who had hundreds of devotees, came across this guy living in a cave and said, this is your guru, not me. And he named the guy who wouldn't even admit to having a name, Ramana Maharshi. That's where the word came from. He turned all these devotees over to Ramana Maharshi and then had to tutor Ramana Maharshi on Hindu mythology because he didn't know it. That came from Kavya Kantha. It's not something that Ramana Maharshi, he didn't read any of it. He didn't know that. He was tutored so he could answer questions and frame questions from the point of view of, of the seeker where he could try to edify that in some way. Things like find your own mind, I can show you where he said that. 
be, be a light unto yourself, I can show you that. The very same things that Robert is pointing out. And he's not a student of Ramana Maharshi. He's not stealing that information. It's just as honest and just as honest. And he ain't under a slab of concrete. It's real right now. <coughs> and he's an ordinary human being. So this thing about this, this guru, Ramana Maharshi, is all bullshit. He's just an ordinary person. And I'd be with Ganesha, and they would be, they'd be doing it in the flat, we'd be having some kind of celebration. And I said, what would an uncle think about this? <laughs> and his uncle was turning over in his grave under that slab of concrete about it all, because it's disgusting. So was his real name Kumari? <laughs> <laughs> but that mythology, he was a, a person of common sense. Education stopped in high school. He was a high school dropout, never, never, it's all that's not there. Just not there. And there's projections and all the stuff that's laid on me and laid on me, all the worship and all the stuff, all of that is blinding. And all of the people who are claiming a lineage whether it's Muji or Gangaji or any of them are crooks. They're stealing something that's not even real and calling it their own and then they can transmit it to you. And his takeaway is you had it all along. That's common sense. You had it all along. Find your own mind. He said it, Ramana said it. This one's alive. The crowd's about the same size. It's just a century later. We know a hell of a lot more now than we did a century ago. We know about anthropology and science and physics, and we know all this stuff that back then nobody knew about, nor did they have the means to get the information that we have today. This is so far beyond a century ago sitting in a hot room in India. And the same, I don't know that much about Nisargadatta other than what Ganesh and Ganesh was friends with Nisargadatta and he told me stories. I know David Godman. I've met him and we've chatted and things. David Godman was behind building up Papaji. He, he brought these cameras and I was there when these, these cameras came in and Papaji sat down and here it goes and the books went up and the whole thing, boom, and people took it. So the, the Osho people, Osho had just died, just kicked the bucket. The next big thing was Papaji, and they flooded in, and here it goes again. Same thing. Don't buy it. I just say, don't buy it. There's real wisdom that's living, that's right here, as clear as a bell. This imaginary relationship that you have with somebody who lived a hundred years ago is crazy. Ramada never charged anybody for anything. He just fed people. He showed up, they got fed. That was it. No money, no... He spoke in terms in his vocabulary and being able to speak, all he had was that mountain of Hindu Verdana talk that he could use. 
Robert's vocabulary is, is like compared to this, to that, and insights, and insights into, into real science and knowledge and things that are provable facts. Used to be enlightenment meant the age of reason where you wake up to facts away from believing all this crazy that's, shit. That's a, that's a great and point. It, yeah. It's bass backwards. They're calling it's what they call enlightenment is bass backwards. It's going now it's it's falling asleep into these religious beliefs. So people like Robert have a gift of expressing it in a real beautiful way. I read, depending on nothing, I'd been reading parts of it and jumping around and alphabetically, and, but I read it all the way through right before coming here. There's no dust left. It's clean, it's clear. And it leaves you with nothing to depend on, no thing to hold on, no touch done. Nothing. Zero. Not. So these other these these mujis. I just think hey, Bentenios. I know Bentenio. I met him. I saw him backstage. He's a fucking asshole. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, there's no two ways about it. On the record, Bentenio, if you're looking, I'm talking to you, and we've had this conversation. Bullshit. Oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> this is delightful. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks for the book review, too. Very, very good. It's very human. Really human. It wasn't a god man or anything like that. There wasn't a crowd around him. The people who want the crowds are this, this new wave of people who are creating all of this myth around all of that. So Toto pulls the curtain back. Robert pulls the curtain back to see. I want to mention something else about your work that I really appreciate. In branding, I'm a branding guy. I, I like the psychology of branding. It's called the Uncola strategy. <laughs> and it's the neti neti strategy. The notion for the wisest counsel. Not this, not this, not this, not this, until what is revelatory is your own realization. Not an indoctrination. What's valuable in Robert not describing what you're going to say because you see it as a realization, not a theocratic indoctrination. And he's very careful about that and as clean as a whistle. And those that want it are not going to get it. You're not going to get a description of what you see and what you are because that's unique and your own beauty and your own marvelous universe. To see and realize for yourself not to be indoctrinated into how Robert sees that. So he doesn't go there. And I really respect that because there's, there's this tendency, because that's what people want, to be told what to see, and he won't do it. Big time respect for that. He doesn't paint those pictures. Doesn't go there. He's even better at it than Ramana Maharshi was. Better at it. And he knows science and he knows anthropology. There's no confusion about stuff. And today we have a global communications and it, ways of tapping information and all this ancient stuff and bring it up 
to the here and now and see for ourselves. But the Krishna playing with Papaji, that was the realization when that was seen as fantasiful thought. And it's funny, people come along, they toto the scene, then they start worshiping Toto. <laughs> they, they, make, they make the idol out of the one who was a Toto who pulled the curtain back and here comes the curtain again. <laughs> the most respect you could do Robert is to not do that. And not wait for a description about what you're supposed to see in your life so that you're not indoctrinated and that you see for yourself. And what greater gift to any seeker in the world than to have that seeking undermined and set aside and that dis-ease of seeking, which is really, as Robert knows profoundly, is a mantra of doubt, as he said earlier, in, in the talks. It's a mantra of doubt. I was telling Tripp, I said, I don't know where I lived to go there or not. This was six months ago. And the idea is, everybody's going, even if I'm dead, <laughs> this thing's going down. <coughs> that was a conversation. You remember that? <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to, to confess that and get it on the record about Ramana Maharshi because it's out of control. That one's out of control. And somebody's got to say it. Thank you for, for doing that. So, <laughs> and, and, and thanks for the book review. I uh, really appreciate that. I think we should call an end to it for now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we'll just um, segue into the evening all together. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>